Hello, I am Joe Kloska. I'm an actor with the Royal Shakespeare Company, and today I'm going to look at a couple of things from the RSC Education's Activity Toolkit for Macbeth. Uh, in this instance, from Exercise Seven, which is about Macbeth's famous soliloquy, his speech about whether or not he should murder King Duncan from Act One, Scene Seven. So, if you can go and read that speech now, or watch a video of it online, and then come back. Okay, so I wanted to just point out some of the amazing images that Shakespeare uses in this speech, in which Macbeth is really doubting whether he can or should or will murder Duncan. So I've just picked out a few that I've that I've seen and that are singing out to me. Firstly, I love it when he says, um, when he talks about the bank and shoal of time, you know, this epic image of this sort of ocean, oceanic image of uh, the bank and shoal of time, shoals of fish, of course, time being this great big epic, uh, epic thing, which Macbeth wants to, to get this instant over and done with so he can then become king. And if he murders Duncan, that's what that would allow. Then I love the image of the poison chalice, which would be commended to his own lips. And this is where Macbeth is, is going back the other way and considering the, uh, the impact of what happens if he murders Duncan, how that might come back to punish him. The poison chalice, the cup with poison in, being forced to drink that yourself. Um, then uh, he goes on to say, to talk about how Duncan's virtues will plead like angels, trumpet tongues. And in that, you know, you see these angelic creatures uh, sort of uh, musically um, uh, broadcasting with their, with their trumpets, these great brass instruments into the air, the news of Duncan's goodness and that Macbeth shouldn't therefore kill him. And then he talks about pity being like a newborn babe, which is a you know a type a, a, and a cherubim, a type of another type of angel, uh, which will which will blow uh, the horrid deed in every eye. So you've got this idea of the news being broadcast by these angelic bodies all around the earth and blow blow the news into every eye so that every eye uh, tears from every eye tears shall shall drown the wind. So we're on to really enormous emotions, all these the, 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 these huge uh, these huge sobs and tears and and drowning the wind. Just a huge image of how to how to stop uh, you know an earthly power like the wind. Finally, uh, in the speech, um, Macbeth has worked himself into a place where he knows the consequences of what might happen, uh, is scared about them, but doesn't know if he's got what it takes to finally push himself to do that. So in this final image in the speech, he says, I have no spear to prick the sides of my intent, but only vaulting ambition, which overleaps itself and falls on the other. And of course there, what, what, what do you use spurs on? Uh, well, uh, you use spurs to prick the sides of horses. So he, f he figures ambition as a horse. Um, he, he, he's riding this horse, but he can't make it jump over the next jump on the race course. And the jump, of course, takes you back to uh, this bank and shoal of time. We jump the life to come. There's one last barrier he needs to overcome. But his vaulting ambition won't let him. It won't let him spur his horse on, kick his horse uh, with his spurred boots and force it over that last obstacle to become king himself. And he says it leaps, it le overleaps itself and falls on the other. So he it falls back and then falls back on the side of not having done uh, the act uh, of murdering. So there are a few of the images in the speech, incredible. And next, I just want to look at this exercise in which we read the speech and we consider whether or not at every moment in the speech, Macbeth is closer or further away from killing King Duncan. So we're going to have a look at that one now. And this is my terrible picture of King Duncan. <laughs> 